Hello, my name is Bob Barker, and I'm one of the managing partners at Barker Gilmore. And thank you for joining us today in one of our GC Advantage uh, webinar series. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the today's topic is perfect for those who are looking to advance their career. Um, secrets to make yourself indispensable to your company. And uh, just a, a, a plug for those of you who may not be familiar with, with our firm, um, we specialize in helping uh, companies uh, build, uh, develop, and optimize their legal and compliance department. And that's whether it's uh, recruiting uh, GCs, CCOs, or, or any cr critical hire um, in those departments, uh, whether it's um, you know, developing individuals through executive coaching, succession planning, um, or optimizing the, the legal and compliance department. Um, you know, Mike, Mike uh, um, is, uh, hand, handles you know, the executive coaching and, and uh, optimizing uh, legal and compliance departments. So, um, and then just uh, uh, as far as the, the GC Advantage program, um, the, uh, the, the, we do have these on a monthly basis. Uh, we've got a, a library of them that, uh, that you can search by just going to the, the website that you see on the page here. And uh, the next webinar that's coming up is uh, the best practices for building a successful uh, uh, board, as a, you know, um, corporate board, general counsel relationship. And the speakers will include a former GC, um, as well as two CEOs and uh, corporate board members. So that, that should be a, an excellent um, uh, event. Um, today's event is being recorded and uh, the, the website uh, will be post, this information will be posted on the website in about three weeks. Um, and uh, uh, an email will be sent to everyone that uh, uh, participates today. Um, as well, you know, with the uh, materials that we're going over today. Um, and then if you have questions through the session, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom app. So just click on that, uh, insert your question. Uh, you, can, you can look at questions that have already been submitted. And if you have a similar question, uh, you can just give it a thumbs up and that will um, you know, uh, Mike and, and Ron will know that that's a, a really high priority question and it, it will uh, get the most attention. Um, let me see. And then, so I guess let me just uh, turn it over to Mike. Um, Mike is a, is a former uh, EVP, uh, Chief Legal Officer and Secretary of Staples, and uh, just uh, one of the most highly uh, requested uh, coaches and advisors on our team. And I think you'll understand why uh, when you get a chance to meet Mike here. Mike, Thank I'll you. turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. And I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay. Um, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning. And uh, my name is Mike Williams. I'm a senior advisor, as Bob said. I started practicing law shortly after the earth cooled. And uh, I was in private practice in Los Angeles. And then I joined one of my clients, Sony Electronics, as its general counsel. And then from there, I went on and became the general counsel and EVP at Staples. So I've seen quite a bit of my time. And one of the things we're going to do today is share some of those secrets that we've observed. And that leads me to the, my fellow panelist and former colleague, Ron Wassinger, who is the general counsel at LG Electronics USA. Ron? Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, like Mike said, I'm general counsel for LG Electronics USA. Uh, we're the company that sells and markets all the LG consumer products you might be aware of, refrigerators, televisions, et cetera. Uh, I, I started a long time ago now uh, practicing law as well, not as long ago as Mike. Uh, but originally, <laughs> I think the for a, uh, dinosaurs roamed the earth when you were practicing, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, started in doing commercial litigation with uh, law firms in Tulsa and Houston, went to law school at the University of Texas. It's a long story, but at about 2000, I made the move to in-house working for Sony Electronics. And I had the honor to be there for about eight, a, little, a little under 19 years, uh, about eight of those. Uh, Mike Williams was my boss and had the pleasure to work with him when he was general counsel of Sony Electronics. Um, I, the last my about eight last years there, I was deputy general counsel. 
And then I had the great honor and opportunity to come work here at LG uh, to serve as a general counsel for LG Electronics. And I'm very excited to be here today. Great. Well, thank you, Ron. And I want to talk to everyone for a minute, and that's a little bit of a, a bait and switch on our title here. We use the term secrets to make yourself indispensable to your company. But when I see the word indispensable, I'm often reminded of what Charles de Gaulle once said in terms of uh, the graveyards of full of indispensable men. And I think the minute you start thinking yourself as indispensable, you have the wrong mindset. I always had to remind myself when I was at Staples or at Sony that if I get hit by a bus the next day, all the stores at Staples would open. No one would shut down, even if I won the lottery uh, and I didn't show up for work. So I think what we have to think about is not being indispensable, but more importantly is how to be um, valuable. That's the key, I think, for all of this in what we're going to talk about today. So instead of referring to ourselves as indispensable, I think we need to think of ourselves as how to make yourself more valuable. And that's what Ron and I are going to share with you, what we've observed over the years uh, in our respective companies. So with that in mind, like any good assignment that we start with, it's always going to be an assessment. Where are we and where do we need to go? So we're gonna first start off talking about doing an internal assessment and then thinking about an external assessment, how people view you in the value creation. So of course you have to be honest with yourself uh, when you're doing an assessment. And that's sometimes hard to do, but you can do it. Um, and one person I know that is honest with themselves uh, and that's Ron. And so Ron, how would you do the assessment? How do, you, what, how do you think about it? Well, I try to do it. And people tell me sometimes I'm a little too hard on myself, but uh, and maybe that may or may not be the case. But certainly you need to be honest with yourself and then do an analysis. And by the way, I want to add, this is really hard because when you work in-house where there's constant management changes, you're needing to do this all the time. And you may be valuable and have a perception and an assessment that you're valuable at one point. And then the whole management structure, key structure may change and you need to start all over. So this is an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time deal, um, but certainly you need to uh, do an assessment of yourself. So what are your strengths? And an, and an honest assessment of what your weaknesses are. I know HR doesn't necessarily like that job, um, um, term, but it's important to, to, to and it, we all have weaknesses. And if we're going through and we think we don't have any, then that's kind of a red flag that maybe we need to assess ourselves a little better. Um, we'll talk a little further about what our job is as an in-house counsel. Um, and there's some slides to talk about that further, but understanding what our job is and what our role is or what our purpose is, is, is an important part of conducting that assessment. assessment. Certainly we are here not to just be lawyers and to, um, when you work in in-house counsel, your, our role is to help the business succeed as a sustainable business for the future. Um, not to fight over what happened in the past or to put up roadblocks, but to help the business to succeed uh, and how to do it in a sustainable way. And so when you do the assessment of yourself of your strengths and your weaknesses, how, what are my, how do my strengths assist us to obtain this purpose? Because right. uh, you'll be valuable if you can obtain this, if you can focus on the purpose of helping the business grow in a sustainable way. And I we always like to say in minimizing legal risks, you can never eliminate legal risks, but how to do it in a way that minimizes the legal risks that exist. And I think the key, um, Ron, I we've both observed over our careers is that everyone knows their job, right? To provide legal advice and guidance to the business unit so it can accomplish its goal. But it's those in-house lawyers who understand that they also have a purpose to build a sustainable business for the future. And when you exude that purpose, when you operate with that purpose in mind, you're transmitting the value proposition to your business people. And the reason I use valuable to your company is because companies don't get rid of valuable assets. And that's the key here. We wanna make sure that the legal department and ourselves are viewed and perceived, and we operate with a value in mind. And you can say, well, Mike, that's great. I'm trying to be honest with myself, but how do you verify your analysis? 
You can do 360 surveys. You can do employment engagement surveys. You can hire an advisor to help you do your analysis. Uh, these are tools that are all online or companies that do this. So it's worthwhile if you think you need to do this now and then to see to yourself, what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? Where are the opportunities for improvement? Now, along with your own internal assessment is the external one. That is how people look at you and are you projecting the value proposition that you should be or do they understand that you have value to the company? So the first thing, I'll have Ron talk about this and that's team play. Certainly being a perceived, uh, viewed as a team player and being a team player, is, is a critical role when you work in, a, in an organization, whether it's a small company or a large multinational company, being viewed and as, operating as a team player is very important. Um, someone who people want to come to that, that will attract um, uh, a desire to work on projects. When pe pe you want a perception that when there's a project the company's working on, that they want you to be part of it because you're going to add insight um, from both a legal side and maybe a practical side, that the, the end result is going to be better. Um, and so I try to develop that also with members of my team, uh, my team, that we're, we're all viewed as a team player in that respect. You don't want to be viewed as moving to the next slide as royalty. Sometimes law lawyers uh, in-house, they want to like sit in their office and people will come to them and they'll dispense advice. Um, that was Mike after he left Sony. That was, um, I, I can't <laughs> yeah. comment. I can't comment on what it was like at Staples. I think that's where that picture was taken. Uh, but you don't want to be where people are just coming up to the legal office for exalted assistance and you're going to dispense um, some, some benefits upon them. Uh, that, that's not going to work. Being willing to get down and dirty and work and understand how the company operates, um, right. how they, uh, what, what the business is like. Um, you know, I, I believe you you build a team and you're viewed as a team player by working on challenging projects. Um, I suppose, you know, sometimes you'll do team roles where you, um, you know, play Twister or something, and those are nice, but I've found that the best way to develop a team and, and to be viewed as a team player is, is to work on projects and work on challenging projects. Right. Um, and also ask and yourself, Ron, you know, is your door open or closed, right? Do people, and ask yourself, the people in the audience, do people in your department come to you and ask you for your opinion, your input, so you are approachable? If they're not talking to you at all, then maybe you are being viewed as royalty, and maybe that's something that you need to focus on. Uh, there are also some other good qualities that we can talk as well. Next one is tough problems. You know, I just noticed that you have a Kansas Jayhawk um, <laughs> Kansas State picture. I didn't pick up on that until just now, Mike. Uh, certainly, I think one. Of, this is my my mantra, and I always talk about this with members of our department. Is we need to be willing to tackle tough tough problems. You're going to be valued by your management and by your clients if you are driving towards the problems, not running away from them and and trying to push them off on someone else. And there are and when you work in house. There are tons of opportunities. There are gonna be so many opportunities, you can't do them all. So you're gonna to have to pick and choose sometimes and be selective. Certainly, you know, talking with your management, your CEO, you're gonna know what his priorities are. And you think about well, what are the problems? What are the challenging projects that are important to him? And you wanna move towards them and be, uh, be a support and work on them. Um, you know, there are over the years, there were lawyers that developed the reputation that if you went into a meeting with them, uh, that they, when the meeting was over, everyone else had things to do and action items, and he or she did not. Uh, and um, that's not a good reputation to have uh, if you want to be valued by the company, especially long term, is you don't want to always have that reputation. So where do you fit in? Where can you be engaged? to actually tackle the tough problem and don't shy away from them, uh, I think is extra important. Right. In the flip side, what we've seen is some of those people who are perceived as passing the buck, right? They don't wanna do the tough job. They like, oh, I can slide it off. And if you're perceived as just passing it along to someone else's problem, like that's not my job, that's not my problem. 
and your client is asking you to handle that tough problem, you don't want to be viewed as passing the buck. I think. Yeah. So if we look back now with the internal and then the external assessment, you know, it's how are you perceived? Are you perceived as a team player or a buck passer? Also, think about your own personal style. Are you amiable? Are you expressive? Are you analytical? Are you a driver? Those are all important because in a way that will tell you also how you should work with people. For example, if you have a manager or a client that's more of an amiable, expressive person, and you're the type that's more of an analytical driver, and you go to them and say, hey, bottom line, just give me the bottom line, they're going to take that the wrong way. But for an analytical driver type of personality, they're going to think that's the normal course of business. So be perceptive to your surroundings and the people you're working with. And now, in terms of this external assessment, it's probably one of the most important things that I want to talk about that Ron and I will do, and that is what we call the core context matrix. And this is something that I started doing years ago when I went in-house, and that is looking at your company and what functions that your company performs are core to it, that is the sustainable business, and then non-core operations that are really not important, the company's not going to shut down, and then it's in the context. Yeah, it may be important, but it's not everyday core. So what I did here is we have this matrix and I filled it out for a retailer like a Staples or a Sony. Now what's core to a retailer? Merchandising, marketing, advertising. I and mean, let's face it, retailers, very simple. They buy stuff and they turn around and sell it. All right, that's the essence of merchandising. You have to market it, you have to advertise it. Those legal items, those legal issues surrounding those should be core to your business. If you're running a law department for retail, you want to have attorneys who are competent and qualified and can give value quickly to the business on those core essential items. Some, depending upon how big your company is, you may have real estate if you're in a growth mode. You know, that one time Staples was opening stores one a day. So real estate was important. But then later on, that change. Manufacturing, like Ron's company, I'll talk in a minute. They're more manufacturing than like a retailer, like a Staples, although they have some branded products. And then securities. Well, it's core if you're a publicly traded company. It's not core if you're privately held and you're owned by some hedge fund or private equity interests. And then you can see in the other things here, non-core litigation. Yes, it's important if you have an antitrust lawsuit or an investigation, but it's not everyday stuff. And uh, now if I was an insurance company, litigation, coverage litigation would be core, but not for a retailer. Um, and then the rest of self-explanatory is no one's going to go out of business if you have an EEOC charge, you have to respond to it. Or employment litigation, one wrongful term case is not gonna put the company out of business, service agreements, my favorite example was a $250,000 uh, contract for an end cap at a retail store. Really, if the contract's not perfect, no one's going to die. It's not going to stop your operations. Uh, Ron, given your op, where would, may, you might change some of these things because depending upon your ops. Yeah. So for one, you know, one of our core roles is we sell to resellers such as Staples, Best Buy. Uh, Home Depot, et cetera. So certainly sales and distribution, probably the top core um, competency that I would put in our upper right box, which is a little, little different than of course Staples is. Manufacturing, you know, we have factories in Alabama and Tennessee, and then of course working with factories in, in Asia as well. Certainly manufacturing is an important part. Uh, related to that is selling products would be, for example, um, uh, monitoring for Consumer Product Safety Commission and compliance with safety laws. Uh, because that can have dramatic impact to your company long, short and long term if you aren't, don't properly comply with those laws. You know, employment counseling, you know, unlike Staple or Staples, who has thousands of people that interact with customers all the time, I don't know if I'd put employment counseling in the upper right quadrant, maybe down a little further, although that's important for every company. But certainly I would. Um, uh, include manufacturing, we would remove securities, of course, because we're just a wholly owned subsidiary of a 
of a Korean multinational, but sales and distribution and all of the issues that go into those relations are is a core function that would be number one on my list. Right. So if we go back to this external observation or an assessment we're doing in the core contracts matrix for your department, one, if you're running the department, you should be asking yourself, do I have the right resources in the Northeast quadrant, right? So I am giving value to my organization. And as an individual, you should be asking yourself, am I working in the Northeast quadrant, okay? Now, I'm here in San Diego and it's great here to be in the Southwest this time of year, but you wanna be in the Northeast, even though the weather's crappy, you wanna be there because that's where the action is, that's core. And that means for your career, you, I mean, I was a trial attorney in private practice, but I moved my practice from litigation and all those skills that I had into corporate business judgment. That's where I could add the value. Uh, and similarly, think to yourself in your own career path, you know, am I in the right place in the right box or should I be trying to do something to move to that Northeast quadrant so I am projecting and I am more valuable to my company. And again, how do you validate your assessment? Again, you could ask for your mentor, an advisor, you can do 360s. I mean, and also some of it's just very obvious to yourself. Look at your company. What do you do for a business? What is your purpose there? And are you in the right location? So, you know, I would say you can always identify there's going to be certain business executives that you are will will be able to identify that you value their opinions uh, and they'll give you honest assessments. You don't want um, and it's good to have those ongoing communications and uh, continue to talk with them because you'll get you know, you can do formal 360s, but you can also constantly be doing um, uh, kind and, of informal as well. Right. And don't be afraid or don't be reticent about asking your boss. So yes, you're doing litigation or employment counseling saying, hey, um, could I work on a marketing project? Could I start doing vendor purchase agreements? I mean, you know, it's uh, one size fits one, but ask because no one's going to come and may wave a magic wand saying, oh yeah, you know, I see and you, you've been doing a lot of this. I want to help me move you up. You know, look after yourself a little bit here and ask if you want to move around. It's not going to hurt in because it also demonstrates that you want to add value to your organization. Now, after we do all these assessments and we talk about internal and external factors, there are certain qualities that Ron and I have observed that are always present in valuable lawyers wherever we work. And I'm talking about private practice, in-house, uh, or wherever. And the first one that I want to talk about and that's what I call selflessness. You're concerned more with the needs and wishes of others than with your own. You're acting with less concern for yourself than for the success of the joint activity. And I always think of, and my mantra here is, I think of Spock. Remember that great 1982 movie, The Wrath of Khan? I mean, it was a classic. It should have gotten an Academy Award. I don't know why it didn't. There may be a lot of Star Trek haters out there. Who knows? But remember when Spock went into the reactor room knowing he would die, but he said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one, right? He was willing to put his own personal needs aside and work for the good of the company or for the crew. And that's what I think of in selflessness. I'm not asking you to throw yourself on the sword every day of the week, but you really do trust people who you know have the needs and wishes of the company, of the department above their own selfish interest, then that's the selflessness that I wanna think about. So one is selflessness. The next one, Ron. <laughs> Second, um, I think which we recommend would be courage. And this is a hard one, um, but I think it's extra important for in-house counsel into doing the ability to do the things that frightens you in the face of danger. Uh, you're worried about it, how you will be perceived, how, you know, um, being able to resolve matters that are, um, where you face uncertainty. You know, at a base level, we all operate under rules of professional conduct. 
that our client is the company, not individuals, okay? But we all have, but we work with people. We don't work with this amorphous company. We work with people day to day and we wanna be liked. We wanna, we wanna get good feedback from them. We wanna make them happy. Sometimes as an in-house lawyer, you need to do things that on an individual or even a department level, it's not best for the overall organization. And that's where this courage comes in, that you're going to have to do things sometimes uh, that a, at, a, at a narrow short-term interest of a person or a department, that it conflicts with the overall um, responsibility for the company. But that's our role as in-house counsel. Uh, my experience is, is that if you do that and are willing to do that, the good managers, the good executives, they recognize that. And then in the long term, you'll be the better for it. Kind of goes to tackling hard problems is when you tackle hard problems, you have to have some courage. You need to be willing to, you know, stir things up a bit. Um, and it's certainly important. And again, the, and you know, you at its core, our rules of professional responsibility require that we have it. And it's much different than I think outside counsel in, in that respect in many ways. And I, I think it's super important and it's something that's very difficult um, for us to manage. One, one right. example I will give on this is, is that I, I've tried to do this and I talk with people in our department is there's gonna be times where we need to ask someone to do something that's better for the company, uh, but they're not maybe personally, not something they, that they like, but there's gonna be all kinds of opportunities where you can work where you're fully aligned. Um, there's a contract, an important contract that they need to get done. And I like to look for those opportunities where I can demonstrate that I'm, 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 or the department is working hard for them and wants to help them succeed. And they, under, they, they, and they develop that. And then when the time comes to ask them to do something that's opposed to their narrow temp, short-term interest, they will remember that. And um, it'll be a, it's a much easier conversation to tackle these kinds of tasks when you've got that level of, um, when, you, when you've demonstrated that you'll tackle these hard problems uh, and you're, you'll work for, for, for them, that when, it, when the time for courage comes, it's, it's, a, it's more manageable and, it gets, and you're more likely to succeed. All right. And one of the things we've always stressed uh, when Ron and I work together was not only were our jobs to provide legal advice and guidance, but the other thing was, in more the paramount was to protect the brand. The brand was everything. The brand of Sony, the brand of Staples, and you realize quickly when you project that value proposition to the client, saying, to the individual executive, saying, excuse me, you're not more valuable than the brand. No individual is more important than the brand. And no individual is going to take care of you for the rest of your life if you get fired for doing something wrong, right? Your license to practice law is yours, not theirs. And, um, you know, the brand, we live it every day. And I mean, you see it's right behind Ron, I can see the, the LG way. And if you have a company that will back you, then knowing that when you do take a courageous stand on a legal issue, you will have the backing of the company. And executive, good executives know that. Bad executives don't. Yeah. I agree. Yep. You know, so behind finally, me, this, this, this what's behind me, and it kind of goes to integrity, is LG follows a business practice called Jung Do Management, J-E-O-N-G dash D-O. It means in Korean, the right way. Uh, and that's our code of conduct and our business practice for everything that we do. And it's, in, it's ingrained in you when you first start here. And it's the most important thing that ever, that should guide our trust. If you go to the LG website, you can get some more details on it. But it follows this uh, quality of being honest, up, up, morally upright, and doing the right thing. Um, and people here do not want to be engaged in jung -do management problems, because that's a sign that there's an ethical issue, an integrity issue. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a method of practice from, from a Korean perspective to do the right thing at all times. That's what's most important, and that'll ge generate the best goodwill for to our customers. Right. So, aside from the value, the qualities in terms of valuable lawyers that we're finding in terms of selflessness, courage, and integrity, the last quality that we've observed, and I think is very important, and people tend to forget this because they think they have to be the top of the pyramid in order to be 
and to demonstrate leadership. And it really isn't. And first and foremost, don't confuse management with leadership. Management is doing things right. We fill out our timesheets. We ask for vacation with us in the HR system. We put in the request for requisitions for supplies or computers, whatever. But leadership, as Ron just alluded to in the LG way or whatever, leadership is doing the right thing. It's not doing things right. And also remember, as a lawyer, as an employee, the job title makes you the manager, but it's the people that you manage. They make you a leader and you choose leadership. Leadership is a choice. It's not a given right. You may be given the title of a manager. You may be given the position of a leader, but it's you that makes yourself a leader. And when I see people, whether it's you know young attorneys who are given a task to manage and they're chose to lead people, I mean, those people that demonstrate leadership and understand that concept, those are truly valuable lawyers to the department and also as a leader, they're gonna be valuable to the company. So now we've talked about those qualities internal, but now let's talk about external behaviors and attitudes that lawyers, if they demonstrate or they practice, add value to the company, or at least that's our opinion. And the first one, Ron, is always the, a popular one. <laughs> Certainly, whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a crisis, I think it's human nature, and I've seen it over and over. People want to focus on, well, who's who's at fault? Who's <laughs> the blame here? Who's and when up? you're in the middle of a problem and you need to solve the problem, you're in the middle of the crisis, it's incredibly unproductive, and it just makes the problem worse when you're focusing on the blame game. And so, and it happens over and over when, a, a, you know, when you're working in-house counsel, there will be problems that are unexpected that come to you and you have to help. And that's where you can be a leader. You can be a team player to focus on how to fix the problem. We can address the blame later after the problem is resolved, after the crisis is over, but it, it, it will make only make things worse if you take part of that blame game and um, and acts, I would say you should we should work hard with the business people to avoid right. that blame game from starting uh, the, because it's very human nature and it happens over and over. Right. And the best reminder I have for this when I see fix the problem, not the blame is the first thing I say to myself when a problem was presented. I think of the little Dutch boy. He's going home. He sees a hole in the dike. And what does he do? He sticks his finger in the dike to save the village. He didn't sit there and look at the hole with the water pouring and saying, who the hell built this dike? Who, are the, who approved the specifications? Who's the general contractor? Let's go sue him. You know, he stayed there overnight to protect the village. He solved the problem. He fixed the problem, not the blame. So think of the little Dutch boy the next time you're confronted with a problem. Ron, you mentioned this earlier. The second is do it the right way um, instead of just really fast. And this is where courage comes in, because sometimes you're working on a project, you're working on a problem, and you're under lots of pressure to do something fast. But you got to do it right. And that should be your first focus. And it's a balance, um, I have to admit. But doing something fast just to get it done, just to please someone because they've developed some arbitrary deadline isn't necessarily the best way to approach it. Uh, you got to do it right then right away. Um, that's certainly important. And sometimes that means working hard, of course, uh, maybe to meet a deadline. Uh, you may have to work hard for a, a short period of time or bring in additional staff to make sure you're doing it the right way, not just doing it immediately or right away. Yeah. No business person is ever going to compliment you for giving them the wrong answer right away. Okay. Yeah. Figure that the way I look at it is you want it right or you want it right away. You know, that's the most important thing. But the flip side of that, is where, and that is speed, right? Well, so. yeah, and so, you know, we, unlike outside counsel, where they're normally, or I know it's changing, but still typically often paid by the hour, where the more you work, the better, I guess. We are fixed cost. Uh, we don't have the luxury of creating a perfect plan, a, a develop perfect advice, perf we need to develop a good plan that we can execute, execute now 
uh, to help the business succeed, not a perfect plan that will take forever. Right. And that's a balance with number two, let's face it, right? You, we want to do it the right way, but you don't, you don't have forever to do, do it the right way. Right. Um, and so some, and, and, you know, I always talk about with this outside counsel, some outside counsel you'll go to, and you don't want to do this if you're in-house counsel, where a client will come to you with a problem, and then you will just tell them all of the issues, all of the concerns, and then maybe throw it back on them on what to do, let them decide, or raise so many issues that it appears you're never going to be able to finish the project. Uh, you need to be able to think through what are the core risks the things that are most important to the company and focus on those core risks of what really matters and not get not get um, buried in the details of trying to make something perfect. So often when I'm doing this, where I'm trying to do a good plan today is what really matters. You gotta get a contract done and there's a red line that comes back because they use outside counsel and it's half of it's red. What really, there's four or five things that really, really matter to you and to the company. Get consensus with your business people and come up with a plan that that focuses on that, not making everything perfect. Right. Because don't let perfection be the enemy of progress because business people want to get stuff done. And that's the, that's right. And if you're coming from private practice, let's face it, guys, in private practice, we operated with the fear of malpractice. You didn't want to screw up. You checked everything out, okay? In-house, we don't have to do that. We don't have to worry about it. And so, you know, maybe another flip side of that, Ron, is about the being proactive. Uh, certainly, it's, it's proactive. It kind of goes to my point of being, of uh, identifying problems and opportunities where you can solve things for the company. Certainly there's a proactiveness to that. By being proactive, you're going to get credit from the management people when you're identifying the, instead of just constantly being reactive. Now it's hard when you have limited resources and you're being constantly bombarded with requests to do A, B, and C to also be proactive. But no matter what, you need to step back some time and looking for opportunities where you can be proactive, think of your head, think around what's what's around the corner. Where what where why are we doing something that if 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 it, we if we're not more buttoned up from a legal compliance side, it could have a severe impact on the brand. Um, that that's super important. Right. And then one one practice tip I'd share with the group, and that is, if you get one or two decent email updates from either outside law firms or vendors about what's going on or trends in your industry, that can help you look around the corners. For example, even though I'm not actively in-house any longer, there's the universal proxy uh, rule that's come out with the ballot. So, you know, people running for board candidates are going to be in the same ballot as your incumbents. Well, that presents a whole host of issues that if you want to get ahead of and be proactive in talking to your business people about it, hey, the world's changing and we have to think about how we're going to position our story or whatever, but being thinking ahead. Well, and then I would just add another example. Uh, the FTC, for example, is very good at communicating what it cares about. Often you'll go to they'll go to a lot of marketing conferences and they might even give their top 10 things that their you know, FTC staff will do. Uh, you know, right now, the FTC cares very much about marketing claims with health benefits because of COVID. They care about it very deeply and it's something they focus on. So when you work in a, a sales and marketing company, as an example, it's always good to know what are the top things that the FTC cares about or the state of California attorney general cares about and focus on those areas to be proactive. Right. And I remember a few years ago, Ron, when you and I were together, it was green claims, eco-friendly claims, right? Uh, about like what companies were saying about their products and whether it was true or not. And that still was, is, I would say it still is. That's one of, I yeah. think that's still in the top yep. 10. Okay. Uh, but certainly health claims have right. moved up to number one, I would say right now. Yeah. And then number five here, and this is something that lawyers tend to forget, but when your client says, what time is it? Don't tell them how to build a clock. Efficient communication is the key. Uh, but I did note on the second bullet point, Ron, your comment about uh, if your client's asking for updates, that's a red flag. Yeah, if they're all, if you're getting emails, hey, what's going on? What's going on? 
that's maybe a sign you're not communicating very well. It'd be much better that you update them and they don't need to be asking you for what's the, the situation. Right. Uh, you know, when it comes to legal, that for a particular client, they may have one thing or, with your department and it's the most important legal issue that they're working on and maybe in, in their life. And so you don't want to be a situation where they're constantly asking what's going on, what's going on. You know, they feel like you're keeping them in the dark. Um, and sometimes there might be business people that go overboard and ask too much, but generally you want to be updating them, not have them always asking you for updates. Right. And when you have those clients, set the expectations early, talk to them saying like, how often do you want to be updated? Like Ron said, you may have a business person who's not sophisticated in terms of legal matters, who thinks this one legal issue they have is the most important thing facing the company when it really isn't but they don't understand that. So you may have to sit down and explain where it is in the scale of uh, importance without demeaning them or the importance of the issue. But at the same time saying, look it, I will give you periodic updates every month or every three weeks or whatever. And if they say, oh no, I wanna know every week, then talk it through. But more importantly, or just as important is what I learned. And I know this will be lost on some members of our audience because I'm dating myself when I'd say, how would Laverne explain this to Shirley from the old TV show? And that, as I learned as a trial lawyer, don't talk like a lawyer, talk like a regular person. Now, I'm not saying you have to be pedantic with your business people, but people that speak simply, plainly, clearly, concisely are the ones that are projecting value. I mean, I'm always amazed when I meet lawyers, they'll write down prior to, or they'll say it even to me, you know, they'll write down prior to this, prior to that. I'm thinking like, you know what, you go to a restaurant and you're asked by the waiter, well, you know, what would you like to have? Well, the, you don't say, well, prior to my entree, I'll have a salad. No, you think before. It's simple English, just but people tend to forget, oh, I got to sound legalese. You don't have to. And then finally, the most important feature, I think, and that's never forget that even monkeys fall out of trees. Let's face it. That is me about to fall out of a tree. And everyone makes mistakes. Learn from them, but don't repeat them. I wanted to make sure that everyone in my department, when I first started at Staples and at Sony, you're going to make mistakes. Nothing to be ashamed about. Okay, everyone makes them. As a matter of fact, the person who taught me this was Akio Morita, the co-founder of Sony. I made a mistake as probably a fifth or sixth year associate with the Kaicho-san, Mr. Morita, I made it, I made an error and I was mortified. I was, and he just looked at me and said, Mike-san, even monkeys fall out of trees. So it's like, if he can, you know, understand that and do all the great things he did, I certainly can as an in-house lawyer. But again, let's learn from them and don't repeat them. So those are sort of the six valuable uh, behaviors or attitudes that I and Ron have observed over the years where lawyers that do these things really do add value to the organization. And another test that we did, and I'll have Ron walk you through it, and that's the Monday self-test. We used to call it the Friday self-test. But in that one. You could do it Monday, Friday, weekly, regularly, I think is most important. Uh, you know, Ask yourself on a regular basis, um, what can I do this week for example, to better understand my client's products and services. That's one of the great things of working in-house is that you can become part of belonging up to the client's products or services. You're not just some hired gun that's that, that, that's involved just to get, get a paycheck. That's one of the great things about being in-house. And so you need to take advantage of it, understand the client's products and the services, uh, understand the client or the company's strategies, goals, and objectives. That requires work. That requires being proactive, learn those things. Um, better know what your clients, their challenges are and their idiosyncrasies. That of course is good communications, being proactive again to understand what those challenges are. Uh, better know the other members of the department and their challenges. Um, that's certainly very critical. You know, I don't have children, but many people, most people I'm trying to think all but one do. I'm not a working parent. Um, and it's something I'm constantly reminding myself that they have challenges that I don't have. And I need to under, be, be cognizant of that and be talking with them about that uh, so that I can be a better man, manager. Then of course, also need to be keeping up to speed on your expertise. 
whether it be, um, you know, like I mentioned, sales and distribution is important in, in my company. So certainly uh, being up to speed on the antitrust laws that relate to that is a, is a core thing they need to do. And th th certainly, and then finally develop, and I'm, I, this is where I need to do always better. I need to do better in all these things, but develop relationships through professional networks tied to my area of interest. I think that's important as well. And make, COVID has made that really tough, I would have to say, well, in the last couple of years. Ron, I've always said, you've always been tough on yourself because I think you do all these things because if you didn't, you wouldn't be where you are today as a general counsel of a very, very large company. But it is, this is such an easy thing for everyone to do this listening on the uh, webinar. I mean, how long can it take? Call up and ask one of your department heads in the, you know, the market, the head of marketing, head of sales, hey, can we grab lunch, a cup of coffee? Uh, just to find out what's like, you know, what are our challenges? Oh, logistics. We're going to outsource the last mile because we need to lower our costs. Well, that may be a challenge. Well, okay, how's that going to be a difficult? Understand so that may make you a better informed executive and also align you with the purpose of your job, which is to create and support a sustainable business for the company. And just as proof in the pudding, the self trust is for real. That's uh, the door jam at my office at Staples, where we, in those days I call it a Friday self-test. I printed this out and I put it on laminated cards. I gave it to everyone in the department. I did it at Staples, I did it at Sony, just to remind myself as I went out the door, you know, what did I do this week? Or what am I gonna do this week to help project value and to understand and be a better in-house lawyer, you know? So that's for something. Now. We're going to talk about, because so far, Ron and I have been discussing the tips or uh, you know, tips and observations, secrets, if you will, on individuals, how to create value or project value for your organization as an individual. Now I want to address those that are running functions, running departments, running operations, about creating a valuable function. And the first thing is to focus on your client and work backwards. Think about this. It really means focus on your client, focus on the CMO, the head of sales, the head of retail, focus on them and work backwards. And the person who really I mean, brought this to a forefront, believe it or not, and for retailers, I hate to quote Jeff Bezos because uh, that way it looks, I think he's more Jack these days than that so probably because he was working then, but the most important thing they did was to obsessively focus on the customer. Their job every day was to make the most, you know, every important aspect of the customer life experience a little bit better. And they had a mantra about it's all about inputs, not outputs. A lot of businesses, and if you go to business review meetings, they talk about outputs, right? Hey, what was our gross profit? What was our net? What were our sales? Well, how many returns did we have? What about this? What about, that? but think about the inputs in a retailing operation or your legal function, what you're doing. So the first thing, it's a virtuous cycle. It's a cycle. The first thing is selection. When you think about it, the inputs, the selection of products that you're offering, then you have the cost. What's going to cost for those products? Is it reasonable? Good value is a range. Then there's the availability. Well, I'm offering 20 products at great prices, but are they available? And then finally, the customer experience, the UX, the user interface, what is it? Now let's apply Jeff's virtuous cycle to a legal function and think about this. In my department, do I have the right level of senior and junior people for the mix of experience and cost? Do I have the right level of skill? Again, remember going back to the Northeast Quadrant does Ron have the right level of skill and expertise for the selection? So when people come to his department, they know that they can pick and choose or they have the right selection. And then look at the cost. Are you running a function that's within, let's say the fleet average? I mean, there's data out there that can tell you how many lawyers there are per billion dollars of revenue or million dollars of revenue in different industry sectors, right? You can look at marketing studies or salary surveys to tell you that an entry-level lawyer, the average in the Northeast is X dollars. 
Are you X plus or X minus? Because your management will look at how you're running your function in your budget. Availability, going back to what Ron talked earlier about communicating and keeping the client. The worst thing you can do to a client is they come to you with a problem, the chief marketing officer, let's say, nope, very, very concerned about an upcoming campaign. He's concerned about some claim substantiation. You said, don't worry about it. I'm on it. I'm going to take care of it. You get the senior guy and then you flip it to some junior person. You do the bait and switch or you're not available to talk because you're doing something else. That's the availability of the lawyers is critical to running a valuable function. And then finally, the customer experience, timely updates, no surprises, be proactive. One of the best pieces of advice I ever received, and that was, you know, you can bring me good news, you can bring me bad news, but don't ever bring me a surprise. Business people don't like surprises. And if something's going bad early on in a matter, tell them <laughs> because they don't want to hear about like nothing's wrong. And then all of a sudden you come in and say, oh, yeah, we just got hit with a $15 million verdict. What? Huh? <laughs> That's bad news. Don't bring surprises. OK, but it's all about the inputs, how you how you staff your function. How much does it cost? Are they available? And the customer, your client, is happy and is not surprised and they're satisfied and you're being proactive in your relationship with the client. That's the keys, I think, to running a valuable function in that you can do, whether it just be a subunit or the entire department. So then final tips for success, Ron? Yeah, just a couple here. As Mike said, one thing is to grow big ears. Uh, and just a couple examples of what that, we already talked about from a legal compliance side, knowing what the FTC cares about, right? That's important, those are big ears. Another would be when you work for a company that has, we all have customers, uh, kind of being part of getting yourself in the loop for the analysis of the customer concerns, the customer complaints, being a, get a sense of where, where are the pain points that you, your business's customers have. Uh, talk to your employees, again, being uh, appreciating that they're working family, um, working parents, for example, when you're not. And then, of course, having the big ears, listening to your clients, understanding what their concerns are, what their needs are. So these big ears can focus on a whole, a whole, different, whole different directions in order, in order to succeed. And then finally, become a trusted advisor and all these things uh, that we've talked about here today, they all lead into becoming a trusted advisor. And there's a book Mike can talk about in a second that, he's, that he loves to talk about. <laughs> you want to be the first lawyer the business person wants to call about something. Um, and and uh, if you are a trusted advisor, if you have courage, if you have integrity, if you go to, if you go to, want to want to go towards the problems and the challenges and not shy away. Uh, they're going to come to you for help and you're going to become a trusted advisor. And then certainly you'll be more valuable to the company without question. Yeah. I think that's the holy, for me, that was the holy grail of being an in-house lawyer to become a trusted advisor where the CEO, the CFO would come and talk to me about, you know, and some business issues or some personnel issues of the company rather than just like strict, like, Hey, Mike, can we do this or can we do that? And it's it's not an it's a it's a it's an ongoing challenge in work. It just doesn't come overnight. Just like leadership, it's ongoing. And when you think about um, you know the the you know trust equation, because I always think of my buddy Yoda, because of the, you know I can't do Spock again, so I'm going to do Yoda. But learn and master the trust equation which is very simple. Trust equals credibility, reliability, and intimacy divided by self-interest. So think about the trust interest, uh, the trust equation. And Ron, you can give us some examples about the three elements that are the numerator there. You know, um, how do you do it? Well, again, the credibility is proactively identifying problems, uh, a project that's, that's hard, that you're going to, but that will show true value to the company. You know, Mike, I think you mentioned the last mile project. Um, you know, that's a, I've been involved in the last mile project. That's a hard project. Um, as opposed to lawyers that just want to do NDAs and services agreements. 
um, being part of a team to implement a good last mile project. There's contracts that are part of that, but doing things like that and, and running towards them, you're gonna build a lot of credibility. Working on a project like that, you'll build intimacy and, and, and in a, on a business sense, of course, uh, being able to know uh, business people and what their concerns are, what their fears are, what their goals are. And of course, then you gotta be reliable. Um, communication is important to that, being proactive in how you communicate so they know you're working on your project. You wanna try, you know, a good, a good lawyer is you make the client feel like they are, they are your only client, right? It's hard yep. to do when you have limited, but if you can accomplish that, you're gonna be viewed as reliable by that person. Um, right. And it, it's, it's an ongoing thing that's very hard to do. And when you work in an organization like mine, that's every year there's reorgs, you got to do this. You have to build this constantly because uh, there's going to be new people coming in and you, you can't rest on your laurels. Right. But I think intimacy is very important to know the client and know their business and uh, focusing like what we talked about earlier, growing big ears, uh, active listening. That's such a critical factor uh, for in-house lawyers to to exhibit in order to show that value. But I remember I received one of the nicest compliments from a general counsel when I was in private. He said, Mike, every time I call you, you talk to me, you know my cases. It's as if I'm the only client you have. Now, I had more than him or it, I should say the company, but that's what I also would say is that it's it's a skill that you have you have to work at, but you can do it. It's not you know, difficult to get that trust equation going and to work it. And then finally, I think what, you know, and I'll say this because I don't make this stuff up, and that is consider the following. Here's like your homework assignment, people, if you want to try to create some more value or project it. Read the trusted advisor. I'd also recommend for all people running functions or about to take over a new function, read the book, It's Your Ship. All right. A uh, great book. And to tell you that everyone in the department received those two books from me, and then everyone at Staples received it. And then when everyone joined, a new lawyer came in, their first meeting with me, I'd give them two books. One was The Trusted Advisor. The other one's It's Your Ship. All right. Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I know he was probably very popular in the 1930s, but his teachings are very important. In fact, uh, we did Dale Carnegie courses because we're a professional services organization. We're selling professional services. We're selling advice. And who better to know about sales than Dale Carnegie? And I know Ron can speak to because he had to go through it with me. I did have to go through one, yes. <laughs> right. I have a book here somewhere. We're yep. kind of in a new building and I haven't fully unpacked yet, but the, the book is here in my office. So. Okay. And then finally, you know, uh, another thing, take a public speaking and presentation course and also a time management course, which we did both at Staples and at Sony. Uh, the reason I say that is because one of the common comments I receive from business people on people who I am advising or coaching is executive presence or presentation skills. Uh, not everyone is born to be a trial lawyer. Not everyone is born to be a natural power pointer, all right? But I did find out one truism, at least being in-house, is that lawyers, we think and process like word, right? Like word documents. We're thinking in word. The business people, they think in Excel spreadsheet, dollars and cents, facts, figures, percentages, okay? But where, do, where does word and Excel meet? Where? PowerPoint. That's it. <laughs> and so PowerPoint is the key. And every sharp and good executive I observed, they were good at presentation. They knew how to work the room and how to work the slideshow. So absolutely think about that. Um, and then again, I'd say time management. And also, if you're worried about your career or your future, you can also talk to an executive coach or perform an assessment for yourself. Um, and with that, I think now, we can go on to uh, the question answer. And let's see. Okay. Oh, here's uh, one question I had. 
Uh, but if you make yourself indispensable, you're not promotable. That's correct. But don't make yourself indispensable. You should be thinking of yourself, I want to be valuable. Valuable assets are promoted. Valuable assets are cherished. All right. I've never seen a company get rid of valuable assets. I've seen them get rid of other things, but not valuable assets. So you're absolutely right. Indispensable. They may pigeonhole you in that one little spot because, oh, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to move that person. But you project value beyond just that one little area with all these attributes. I think you're on a great career path. I, and, I agree on that 100%. Yeah. I mean, Ron's, Ron's the living example of someone who started out. I mean, uh, he didn't start out in a log cabin, okay, even though he was no. from the, you know, Texas, all right. But he started out an entry level position at Sony and was a contract administration, contract admin, Ron. And yeah, I, I, I was doing litigation and I hated it discovery, you know, and especially commercial litigation, you're never going to the courtroom. So I wanted to make the jump over, but I had no skills to work in house. I had never negotiated a contract. And so I um, took a, a, there was a job opportunity in San Diego for a contract administrator because Sony was moving its bio business and its digital imaging business to San Diego. And um, uh, I saw the opportunity to work um, with a good person who super impressed me. Um, who would have been my supervisor. Uh, and I thought, you know, a great opportunity to learn from him. And um, so I, I took that approach and um, and uh, things worked out pretty well. Yeah, I think things worked out great. You went from there to being a vice president and deputy GC, you know, and then, then you became a GC. So, I mean, the stuff does work, okay? And I know we're running up against our time slot and I don't want to impose on anyone's time. I did get one question about the trust equation and I would like that if that individual wants to contact me personally, I'd be more than happy to go over it in detail, including the part about self-interest, which we all have. I mean, which is, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your own, someone's going to look at you saying, well, why is he or she saying that? Is that, are they trying to do something easy for themselves or for the company? So we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay, and I'll turn it back to Bob. Well, uh, thanks so much for to, to both you, Ron, as well as Mike. Um, obviously, the, uh, there's a ton of information here, uh, many requests for um, the slides as well as the recording, um, and those will be available to, to everyone. Um, and, and we just ask that uh, you take a, a minute, we'll be sending out a, a, a survey, just a one minute survey uh, to provide some feedback. Um, and if there's any other questions we can answer for you, um, we can capture it there. But um, I, again, thank you to, to both Mike, Ron, as well as everyone who attended today. Um, great information, very practical advice. And uh, we look forward to, to having you all participate in a future uh, GC Advantage uh, webinars. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Ron. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye now. Bye now.